Grant and the whole team and the worship and how they lead us, and it's good, don't you agree? You have a, you have a very special thing going here at Harvester Troy, and I'm excited for you. And, and the kids' event, there's some great things happening as seeing young people coming together and students worshiping God and honoring God, and there's, there's good days ahead for us. You know, we come together, oftentimes we see each other in the lobby, you're coming here, you say, oh, hi, how you doing? I say, hi, Scott, how you doing? And Scott's supposed to say, great, how are you? That's right, right. So, how are you guys? That's great, that's great. I'm glad, I'm glad that's the church thing to do. Now, you may be doing terrible, but you're supposed to say, I'm doing great, because we're in church, right? Isn't that funny how we do that, expect it, and if someone, if you say, hey, how you doing? They go, oh, I'm doing terrible, you're just kind of stunned. You don't know how to respond because I, you're supposed to ask me, and I'm supposed to say I'm fine, and that's good. And you know, but truth is, today some of you are doing great. And some of you are just doing good. You you woke up, you feel good today. You you got a big bonus last week. You got your dream car. He finally asked you, and you said yes. You know, just wonderful things are happening in your life, and you're everything's good. And others of you are um, not there. I mean, if you're real honest today, you say. Man, do I, I'm, life just stinks right now. You know, in fact, I, I got that notice, and I, I thought I had the job, and I don't anymore. I, I got the call from the doctor, and it's not good. And, or my dear friend or my family member just passed away, and I'm scared. And, or the guy who promised to share his life with me just walked out. And that happens as part of life too, doesn't it? So sometimes we really are doing well, and other times we are not doing well. And the psalm we're going to look at today is a psalm of honest prayers. We're looking at these different ones, and I appreciate the ones that have been put together. In fact, Gustavo was key on this series and which ones we look at. Psalms 42 talks about a grieving heart, and some of us today are grieving. Now that grief may be fresh, or maybe it's something that's been around for a while, but it's still a part of our hearts. And how do we do that? Grief, one definition of grief is deep sorrow, especially caused by someone's death. Mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, is the expression of deep sorrow for someone who has died. And you have been there. I'm sure you have been. Everybody has been or everybody will be. That deep pain from within, that deep loss and the deep sorrow. I read a couple weeks ago from a young widower who wrote about the death of his wife and how he just can't get his life back together, the pain, because the expected dreams of sharing years together, how suddenly it was gone, and he said he lost his whole identity of who he was, his whole future, and he's having such a hard time putting it together. That's part of grief. My mom became a widow at 96, and her grief and pain was just as real. The great loss and sorrow from you sharing a life and your dreams and future ahead of you, and again, that grief is not just in death. But it's the grief of a great loss in your life, of a relationship, or a dream, or hope, or what you thought was your future. There are certain stages of grief that we go through, and you've, you've seen these before, and there's different lists, but they basically come down to something like this. There's the pain of denial, the first spot, where we go, no, that, that can't be. When you get that horrible news, you just go, I, that can't happen, that can't be, and you just can't hardly face it. That's your brain just trying to wrap around your emotions of what is in front of you. Denial is very real. That deep pain that you can't imagine how horrible this loss can be. And then sometimes it turns into an anger. Or you're just mad about what happened. It's a very natural step and response. And then you do the bargaining and just kind of, you plead and say, God, if you would just not change and turn this around, I will do anything. And we're trying to make it work different ways. And then sinks into this depression that sometimes is just overwhelming, the darkness that seems to cover you. And then we finally get to that place of acceptance. Now, this is a natural pattern that goes through. And sometimes what happens is we can go one through step through, through another step and just go quite easily, sometimes we'll get in one and we just get stuck. Sometimes we can be stuck in pain or we're just stuck in anger. And you see the person who's been grieving for years and have become a very bitter person in their life. But these are hard things. And we think, well, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, I'm a person of hope, a person of joy, and I believe in heaven, so I shouldn't go through any of this stuff. But we do. It's a part of life. But we do it in a way that's different than those without the hope of Jesus. 
within the, those that think this is just the end of life, it's done and over with, that's hard and difficult. But when you say, how do I put together my faith, what the Bible teaches, and how do I walk through grief and great loss in my life? How do those things come together? And that's what we want to take a look at today, a very honest prayer from Psalms 42. Psalms 42, it actually begins in, and you're heading there if you look at it in your Bible, and actually we're going to walk straight through this, so you can follow your Bible, or I encourage you to use the app, it's a great place to follow along to. It starts out with, this says, for the director of music, a mascal of the sons of Korah, and it says, book two. Now you think, what is book two? Actually, the book of Psalms, as we know it today, was five books at one time, and they were all combined together. So this is the beginning of book two, the second part of Psalm. 42, the director of music, so it was written as the other psalms we've already looked at. It was uh, to be put together with a song, with music, and they would sing this when they would gather in their synagogue or temple or in the church gathering. A mascal is a teaching psalm. There's different ones. There's a number of those that says there's a point of teaching in this one. So when you do this song together, when you sing this, there's a lesson in here. The sons of Korah are the Levites. These were the teachers, the worship leaders of the church. So he said, there's a lesson to this one. This is about the instruction of the truth of God in difficult times. Begin verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. So he's this deer that's coming to the water. It's panting. It's not just lazily walking up and getting a drink. He's definitely in need. It gives the implication he's been running along. He finally gets to water. He desperately wants this water in front of me. And it says, my soul, my innermost being, God, that's how I crave for you. I need you right now. Verse 2, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? So it's a statement of faith. It says, God, you're my living God. I know you're my living God. But he's pleading with God saying, God, I need you. Basically, like, where are you, God? You have those moments in your life when in loss or grief or shock where you're going, God, where are you? I need you right now. You ever have those times? We just sang a song that said, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. We have that statement of faith. But there still are some times he is saying, God, I know you're living God but I need you right now, desperately. He's at a desperate place in his life. He's pleading, God, where are you right now? Now, as a new believer, we come and we get to know Jesus and salvation and great, this body of believers, I think life is so good, and then all of a sudden, something happens. You just go, whoa, well, I thought when I became a believer, everything's going to turn around and be good, but life goes on. We live in a broken and a fallen world, and it's hard some of us have been seasoned in faith for a long time, but still when those moments hit of grief and sorrow, it's shocking and hard, and we can relate to this guy where he is saying, just like a deer pants for water, God, I need you right now. Verse 3 says, my tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? He says, I just can't stop crying. Now, some of you are very emotional people. Some of us are not emotional at all, but there's still those moments when it just hits you. And this, this person is saying, I just can't stop crying. I'm just crying day and night. It's just so overwhelmed. And he's saying, the people that are around me are, are just poking at me right now. And you've been in that place. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's your family who are you staying your belief in God, and then they're saying, oh, yeah? Well, where's your Jesus now? You say you're a believer. Where's all this? Why is this all going wrong? And you say you're, Jesus is going to bail you out of all kinds of trouble, and, and they question you. So on top of your grief, now you have people picking on you, on your faith as well. And then verse 4, these things I remember. As I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. He says, He's saying, God, I remember how I used to go to worship, and I would just worship you, and everything was good in that setting. And he's cra craving for that to come back again. And then verse 5, he says, my, my, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So he's making a decision. I'm so downcast, I'm so discouraged, I'm so disheartened, but he's saying, I will put my hope in God and I'm going to praise him. He's stopping and saying, God, I remember what it was like when things were going well. 
And I remember that you're a living God. I can't stop crying. I'm hurting. I'm pain. I need you, God. I need that sense of your presence around me, and it's overwhelming. I like a statement that just says this. If I can find it. No matter what the circumstance or loss, we can be in God's presence when we give praise to God. And I don't know where you're at right now, where you've been, or what's going to come in the future, but when you're in those sense of loss and pain, that's what the author is saying here. God, I need you. I want your presence. I want that connection. And he's saying, I am just going to worship you and honor you anyway, even when I don't feel like it. It's a statement of commitment before God and saying, God, I need you in my life. And so in our sorrow, we need to remember the goodness of God. Those times when you're just empty and you're full of sorrow, you're saying, God, I remember your goodness. I remember back when things were going well. And you put yourself back in that place and remember how things were. It's hard to remember good when you're overwhelmed by grief. It's easy to remember the bad times, isn't it? Sometimes you just get those triggers and you go, I remember this pain and this pain and this heartache and I remember that stuff. But when you're overwhelmed with grief, it's hard to remember good. The goodness of God is there. There was an, a doctor that moved into a little town year, many years ago, and he moved in, and he got this quick rep, uh, um, rapport around him, and everybody's saying, oh, he can cure anything, he can fix anything. And there was old Joe, who was just a town skeptic, and he didn't like hearing how good this new doctor was, and he didn't like doctors anyway, so he thought, I'm just going to fix this. So he went to the doctor, and he said, hey, doc, I got a problem. I bet you can't fix this. And the doctor said, well, what's your problem? And he says, well, I can't taste anything anymore. And this is pre-COVID, all right? So it wasn't a COVID thing that. <laughs> but he says, I can't taste anything. And he says, oh, let's see. And he rubbed his chin. And he goes, oh, I think I got something that can help you. And he goes, let me get old jar number 47 down. And he got it down. And he said, stick your finger in this and put that on your tongue. And he put it in his mouth. And he just spit it out. And he goes, this is awful. What is this stuff? And the doctor said, I cured your, your taste. You can taste it now. And old Joe, he was mad. He left, and he was just grumpy for a while, and he thought, I, I didn't fix this. And he tried to think of another way he could prove the doctor was wrong. So he went back, and he said, Doc, I got a problem. And he says, old Joe, what's your problem now? And he said, I can't remember anything. I don't remember anything at all. And I bet you can't fix that. And the doctor said, well, let me think. He rubbed his chin and thought for a little bit. He goes, you know, I'll just get down that jar number 47 again. And he turned around. Old Joe had ran out the door. He remembered. He came back with it. You know, that's kind of silly. It's a dumb story. It's supposed to be funny, all right? But we have those things where we choose what we remember and don't remember. But you know, we need to remember what we taste. And when you really taste the goodness of God, you hang on to that. Because there's going to be tough times in life. There's going to be hard times in life. And we remember the sorrows. We remember the bad stuff. But remember the goodness of God and what that means. And so different times here, he keeps saying, I remember. Look at verse number 6. He said, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. From the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Miser. And he's, he's naming specific places. He said, I remember you from, God, I just think back to the beauty of the Jordan River, the grandeur of Mount Hermon, and Mount Miser is one of the peaks there. And he goes on and he says, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. And he's remembering the majesty of God. So here's a few pictures of what he's remembering. He's looking back and he says, the beauty of the Jordan River, God, I remember how you do it. And in the Bible times, the river, the water was the flow of life. And how God provides and God gives nourishment. He says, God, I remember how you flow through this land and you flow through my life. How you provide. The Mount Hermon is this huge mountain in the north. And in fact, there's snow skiing right now. There's just a beautiful place. And he's saying, God, I remember your incredible majesty that's there. He says, the waterfalls. And Gustavo, you went with us to these waterfalls a few years back. And he says, beautiful waterfalls in Israel. And he says, God, I remember the power and the beauty of how you just wash over everything. And remember, he's downcast. He's discouraged. He's in sorrow. And he's stopping. And he's saying, God, I remember how good you are in all these things. I remember your power that's there. And then verse 8, he says, By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He's not just going off poetically and talking about something that's unreal. He's cleaving to God. 
God, I need you right now. I remember your power, your beauty, and he's specifically saying, I remember your love. So in my discouragement, make sure you remember the love of God. You remember his goodness? Remember that he loves you. Even when you can't feel it, even when you can't see it, you remember the goodness of God and you remember his love over you. I like Psalm 73, 26. It says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the portion of my life and my hope for, God is the portion of my heart, strength of my heart and my portion forever. That God has strengthened your heart from within and says, God, I remember this. I remember that I just can't do it anymore. I can't get out of bed. I can't move forward tomorrow, but you are my strength. And you're the one who's going to provide for me. Verse 9, he continues as I said, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? You know those times when you just feel that way? Very honest, God, did you forget about me? Do you know I'm still here? Why must I go about mourning? oppressed by the enemy he says why do i have to keep this grieving in my heart and he says he's oppressed by the enemy so not only is he grieving but he's got this oppression coming over him there's there's emotional stress also verse 10 he says my bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me saying to me all day long where is your god he's saying i am grieving i'm hurting i'm under this emotional pain as well as physical pain right now and he's pleading out to god and then verse 11, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So he makes that statement again. I think he's trying to remind himself, and we need to remind ourselves, why am I so distressed? Why am I so overwhelmed? Because the realities of life. But he said, in the midst of this, I'm going to put my hope in God. Now, that sounds good, and we use that, but I think many times we're, we're confused by that word hope. When I, we think of the word hope, it's not a good translation of the word in the Scripture, because we think of hope, it's like, oh, God, I hope I win the lottery this week. God, I hope I get that promotion. God, I hope I pass the test this week, and, you know, we'll do pretty please, God, and I'll cross my fingers, and we do that like he's a great big Santa Claus, and that's the kind of hope we have. Like, there's no chance in the world I'm going to pass this test, but God, I hope I will. You know, that's, that's not the hope that's in here, all right? The hope that's in here is a different kind of word. And I like how Will, Will Mancini says it. Mancini says it. He said, the word is elpis. It's not a wish or an insecure desire. It's an expectation of the future. It's what we believe is coming that shapes our behavior now. Think about it a little bit. Our hope is something that we know. This is the promise of God. This is sure. And these promises are real. And so because of that, it shapes my behavior. It's something that I know is going to happen. I know heaven is real. I know hell is real. I know when God makes a promise, he's going to fulfill that promise. And so I'm going to stand upon this. And because of my trust and hope for the future, that shapes my behavior now. Does that make sense? Because God said this. Okay, if that's true, and it is, then how do I respond in the midst of this now? That's what he's saying. He says, why are you so downcast? Why so disturbed? Put your hope in God. Put your trust in God. Put your faith in God. I still grieve. I still hurt. But I believe the promises of God. I believe his words are true. And in my grief... Make sure we remember our hope in God. That it's sure. It's solid. We're still going to hurt. But God, I know your promises are true. And I'm going to remember your goodness. And I'm going to remember your love. And that changes how I hope in God. A few verses that you've heard before. Matthew 5, 4. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. So in our grief, he doesn't say you won't ever mourn again. No, we do. Jesus mourned and grieved at the death of his good friend Lazarus, and he wept. But he's in your mourning, you turn to God and ask for his comfort, and he says he will. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, Do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. 
So don't grieve like people who don't have any hope in heaven or their hope of heaven is just a wish and just like, oh, I hope there's something else out there. We know there is. So we will grieve, but we grieve with a certain hope of God. John 14, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you and that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. It's the promise of Jesus. He's preparing a place for you. And that's just not some room. It is specifically prepared for you. Revelation 21.4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has been taken away. That's our promise. That there is a place where we're going to go that we're going to be in the presence of God. Amen? Amen? We still grieve. We still suffer loss. But we present those before God and we remember his goodness and we remember his love and remember your hope that you have, even in grief. There's a couple of verses that I love and Grant, you guys can come on up here and it's a psalm or some scriptures that sometimes we forget that are in the Bible. And I love the songs that we sing that have depth to them. And this is one of those songs, it's a fun song, but it has some real strength to it. And it's a psalm, or this, this Isaiah 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came on Elijah and gave him these words. And we see Jesus repeat these words later. Isaiah 61, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He says, It comes to comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion, and to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Some of the people who are in pain. He says, instead of just the ashes, and ashes are what people did, they put ashes on themselves when they were in mourning, so people would know. It'd be like we wear black today. He says, instead of wearing black, I'm gonna give you a crown of beauty. Instead of this the oil of joy. He says, I'm going to give you joy instead of this mourning that you just have to grieve. He says, I'm going to pour just joy all over you. And I'm going to give you praise for that heaviness in your heart. And then Psalm 30, verse 11, he says, you turned my mourning into dancing. And now you think, how can I do that? I'm mourning. I'm grieving, God. But he says, I'm going to restore and rebuild within you. So no matter how much you're grieving, no matter how your pain is, no matter your loss is, God says, I will put hope back in your life when we turn to God and ask him. Let's pray. God, thank you for the promise that you will comfort us in our loss. And God, I thank you for the promise that you'll give an oil of joy.